That's why I'm here. That's why I'm alive tonight, is to give God glory. Some places you go to, all you hear about is the good men, the great men, the men, the men, the men, the men. But the men can't go with you where the Lord can go with you. You turn the book of Romans 8 with me tonight, please. Romans chapter number 8. Scripture says in verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. As far as I want to read right there, but I want to tell you about something that's just happened here recently. And then I'm going to contrast it with what I'm talking about in the message tonight. How many of you are aware of what's happened up in Indiana with this demon-possessed boy? One of you. Two. This doesn't happen every day. And a lot of so-called demon possession is nothing in the world more than just wild, fanciful minds. But this is a genuine case that cannot be explained. It took five men to hold one seven-year-old boy down. That in itself ought to make you do some thinking. Five men to hold one seven-year-old boy down. We got seven-year-old boys in here tonight. Close to seven. How old are you boys back there? You're nine and behind you. How old? All right. Imagine how little a seven-year-old is going to be. Jeremy, seven. Jeremy, seven. Would you stand up, Jeremy? Can you imagine five men holding that little fellow down? Thank you. Five men. It took that many to hold him down. What did he do? DCS. Department of Children's Services family case manager Valerie Washington was then called in to evaluate the children. When she met them, the youngest, she reported, started to growl, the seven-year-old, and flash his teeth at her. His eyes then rolled back into his head. Then the seven-year-old lunged for his older brother and put his hands around his throat while saying in a voice that wasn't his own, it's time to die. I'll kill you. According to Washington's report, I know I'm just jumping into the middle of it, but I've got a reason for this. Once released from his brother's grasp, the nine-year-old allegedly started headbutting his grandmother. Campbell took his hand and started to pray when the boy walked backward up a wall and onto the ceiling. I see that as an absolute, utter impossibility, according to the law of gravity. He walked backward up the wall and onto the ceiling. Once there, he flipped and landed perfectly on his feet. Washington's DCS report is corroborated by Willie Lee Walker, a registered nurse who was in the room with them. She said... He walked up the wall, flipped over her, the grandmother, and stood there. Walker told the star, there's no way he could have done that. Washington, in her report to police, described the boy as gliding. Police captain in uh, Gary, Indiana, sent in to investigate this. And I don't have his name and all the information tonight. I just wanted to make you aware of what's going on. The police captain has been on the police force for decades, says that it is undoubtedly a situation of demon possession. If you get down to the bottom of the article, I started reading what the atheists and agnostics had to say about it, and every one of them, every last one of them said, I don't believe a word of it. Do you know why they don't believe it? Because their God, which is science, cannot explain it. That's why. 
It goes way beyond any human comprehension. Now the church I was saved into laughs and makes fun of stuff like this. And it, wasn't take, it didn't take me long when I got saved and started reading the New Testament and the people that the Lord Jesus confronted with demon possession before I began to realize we've got a big problem with organized religion in the Bible. Organized religion does not believe the Bible. They create their own little religious world and they live in it. And they deny, 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 deny. Demon possession is a reality. Most of what goes on in this country where these people grab up guns and go out and shoot people to death and mass, massive, uh, in mass shootings and so forth are demon possessed. They're demon possessed. They become murderers. They become killers, wanton killers. They're demon possessed. But you're going to hear much more about this because this is one of, this is one of those unique cases that absolutely defies explanation, yet it is a fact that's the issue. It happened, folks. It happened. It's not some wild, crazy family coming out and talking about this. There's more people involved. When this nurse and someone else, the three people in the room, I think it was, observed it, she laid her credentials on the line. She's an RN. And she laid her credentials on the line when she said, I saw it. I saw him walk up the wall, walk up to the ceiling, and flip. That's demon possession. That doesn't take me by surprise. That doesn't surprise me one bit. I'm a Bible believer. There is a world of wickedness and evil out there. So you have to make a choice tonight. You choose that world or you choose the world of righteousness and holiness and truth and light. There's no middle ground. You either choose to walk with the Lord and walk in fellowship and communion with God or you walk in blindness and darkness and stumble into that world. And the Bible said it is the world that the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. It's a real world. I think sometimes Christians become sheltered in their churches and become uh, kind of, uh, you know, in the sense that they really, they don't, they don't really understand what's going on outside, how bad it's getting. It's bad out there, real bad. <clears throat> this is why when the Lord Jesus came, he confronted these demons. So in Romans chapter number eight, it says, if we walk in Christ Jesus and live in Christ Jesus, that we have the ability and by him and through him, we live in that law of life in Christ Jesus, which makes us free from the law of sin and death. There's only two laws. One law leads to life. The other one leads to death. This family right here, this family had no way to handle this demon. They couldn't handle it. Couldn't handle it. And I am not an exorcist. I'm a pastor. And so therefore, I don't go out to exorcisms. And somebody tries to call me and say, preacher, we've got a haunted house or we need a demon. Call somebody else. I'm a pastor. But if I have to deal with a demon inside this church with some of the people that I pastor or in their family, then I have a responsibility to do that. You see what I'm saying tonight? We don't call in other people. We deal with it. And I have had to. And I have watched them leave. I've seen the power of God over the power of hell. I've seen peace and power come back into the lives of people that were possessed with demons. And so it's a reality. But there's a law of life and liberty in Christ Jesus. And there's a law of sin and death. Now tonight you are under one of those laws. If you're born again, if you truly are, and walking in communion and fellowship with God, then you can be assured that you're in the law of life and liberty. And that's wonderful. Hallelujah to God. Amen. But don't ever think that you may not be confronted with an evil spirit or with the evil of this world, because you can be. But if you're born again, you should know that the power of the Holy Spirit of God and the finished work of Christ on the blood atonement has defeated Satan and his power over your life. And you can rest in that. That's a wonderful thing. So the Bible said in Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 31, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? God is for us. The way you think in your mind is going to determine the way you live. 
And the way you think in your mind is going to determine what you allow into your life and what you reject. And don't, uh, someone said, well, now I have the mind of Christ. You may have and you may not have. I hear people who, who ca with a cavalier, nonchalant, laid back attitude say, the idea is, well, I'm born again. I've got the mind of Christ. You may not have. That's, if you do, why does the Bible say you have to renew it? If you do, why does the Bible say you've got to put on the new man? No, it's not automatic. You can have the mind of Christ if you walk in communion and fellowship with the Lord. That's promised to you, but it's not automatic. Because if you fill your mind with the world and fill it with death and destruction and hell and demons and what opens you up to demon possession and, what, and, and if you're a born again Christian, they can't possess you, but they can sure oppress you. They can cause you, a tr they can cause you trouble. If you, you can open yourself up to that, then don't think for a moment you automatically have the mind of Christ because you've got a corrupt carnal mind and you have to deal with that. And the only way to do it is spiritually because that's how it came about to begin with. So if God be for us, who can be against us? How you think. 1 John 3, 1 says that we have access to the Father because we're sons. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. He will never lose one of his children. That's not going to happen. He will not lose a son of God. If you've been born again, that new birth is forever. And he made you a son. That means that you have the very likeness of God in you and the essence of God dwelling in you. That's a wonderful thing. Satan hates that. You become a target of evil spirits and this world. If they hated Christ, they're going to hate you. That's all. That's what's going to happen. If they hated him, they're going to hate you. Have you ever walked into a room, walked in, walked into a room, you, first time, sometime, you ever been there? You walked into that room and you said, there's something in here. Amen. Nobody's ever had that happen. All of you have. You know why you did that? The Holy Ghost threw up a red flag, said, leave. Now, an unsaved man, he may feel may feel tension or something or whatever, and sometimes not even feel anything. But if you're born again, you have that. And I felt it. I felt it more than once. I felt it in different places. I have felt it around people. I have felt it from certain people. I have felt evil coming forth from that person. And I'm not talking about born again believers. I'm talking about people that aren't saved. If you're born again, you've got the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit and an evil spirit will not both reside in the same vessel. <coughs> That's not going to happen. That just cannot happen. But you can have your mind, that, uns that, that unsaved mind, the old man, that unsaved mind can be filled with spiritual influence, wickedness, and godlessness beyond your wildest imagination. You ever wonder why sometimes... People that you know are saved, you know they're born again, how they can backslide into some of the worst, filthiest stuff you ever imagined in your life? You ever wonder why they can do that? They can do that because the old man is not saved. And the old man is still clamoring for control and dominance in your life. So the battle rages, the battle rages between the old man and the new man. This is why you must put on the Lord Jesus, put on the new man, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So, sonship is a wonderful, blessed thing. The Bible says in the book of Galatians that Ishmael persecuted Isaac. The reason Ishmael persecuted Isaac is because he that is born after the flesh will always persecute he that is born after the spirit. Religion is fleshly. And these people that make fun of Bible thumpers, I'm a Bible thumper. Thump, thump, thump. I'm a Bible thumper. And oh, they laugh and mock me and make fun of me like you wouldn't believe. I'm a preacher. I'm an old fashioned preacher. That's what I am. A hundred years ago, I would have been just like 10 hundred thousand, just like me out here, at, preaching everywhere. I was, you know, I'm an anomaly. I'm, I'm an anachronism. I'm out of place. I belong to a, 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 a generation that's gone on before us. I read stories how those old preachers, they said they'd work in the field all day long, come in and preach revival, and said their shoes would be soaking wet from the sweat off their body, would fill their shoes with water 
I've had Ed Blue tell me that and other preachers that have been around for years said they preached like that, preached all over. They just preached. That's the kind of preaching that saved America. That's what did the job. Old-fashioned Methodist and old-fashioned Baptist up preaching God's Word. But you don't hear a whole lot of it today, do you? Not a whole lot. So Ishmael will always persecute Isaac. Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse number 3 says, He hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The word blessed comes from the Greek word makurios. And that word does not mean just happy. <laughs> I mentioned this Sunday. <clears throat> a lot of people have the idea, I'm blessed, I'm happy. No, there's far more. If you've been blessed, there's far more to it than that. First of all, you've been brought into the favor of God. His favor. God will make a distinction between you and the unsaved. You're His child. He gives you favor. He gives you favor of prosperity. He gives you favor of privilege. He gives you favor of protection. That's all yours. He will prosper you when they fail. And I'm talking about money. I have been blessed. I have been blessed with things that money cannot buy. Millionaires are dying all around you. <laughs> if they could buy health, if they could buy the things that God blesses us with, they'd certainly do it. But they can't buy it. It pays to live for the Lord. <laughs> Yes, it does. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. It pays to live for God. So, God has blessed me. One of the Old Testament words translated blessed means literally kneel. That's what the word means. It means to kneel. That's strange, too, when you look at it, but then you begin to think about it. Why would the King James translators translate, translate a Hebrew word that means kneel as bless? You know why? Because when you humble yourself and kneel down, that's when He can bless you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. That's right. He'll bless you if you'll humble yourself under His mighty hand. He's a good God. My God's a good God. He's never done me wrong. And everything He's ever done for me was for my good. Yes, sir. He has been good to me. Yes, He has. God's been good to me. He's raised me up from the dunghill when He saved me. And then He's chastised me and taught me and directed me since I have been born again. And He let me know that I'm His son. And oh, how I rejoice in that tonight like you wouldn't believe. I've been ostracized by men, kicked out and run off, talked about like a dog. And you have too. You will be too. If you only knew what all said behind your back, you couldn't come into this church, you couldn't stand it. <laughs> I'm not saying everybody's doing that. But there are people that are so jealous of everybody. They're so envious of anything. They're so selfish. They, they're penny pinchers. They won't give anything to help somebody. And they wonder why God doesn't bless them. If you learn a secret, and that secret is, don't let anybody know. Don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. Help somebody. Slip them a little bit. You see them down and out and hurting, help them a little bit. You won't lose it. God will bless you. The fact that you've got it to give is the fact that God's blessed you. I had rather, much rather be able to give than have to to receive, but sometimes God will make you receive to break your pride. Some folks won't let you help them. They're puffed up with pride. And that's no good. A person like that has a hard time receiving salvation. They're so puffed up with pride. When I came as a sorry, low down dog to God and said, God be merciful to me, a sinner, I wasn't hiding anything. I wanted help. I needed to be saved. God didn't just polish me up and make me better and, and you know, pick me up and say, when I hear I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of help you along the way and you save yourself and I'll help you save yourself. And that's religion. I've heard preachers that it would, it would choke them to death to confess that they'd ever sinned. 
They have this high, holy, pious attitude that they build up around them. The Bible says, pride goeth before a fall and the Holy Spirit before destruction. I don't make any bones about it. I was a sorry low down dog. God saved me. I was a Mary Magdalene. I was one that seven demons was cast out of. I didn't deserve to be saved. I deserved to go to hell. I ought to be in hell right now. But by the grace of God, I'm here tonight before you. You start talking to people like that, and they think, well, there's nothing, I can't hide behind him too much. <laughs> so they go out and find them some religious stuff shirt that they can get behind. And it won't help you any bit. Won't help you a bit. Carries divine favor. God's for us. He's long suffering to usward. Long suffering. He's merciful, full of mercy. Merciful. Moses, you want to see my glory? Here's my glory. Mercy, 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 mercy. Mercy on top of that mountain. Just Moses and God. And Moses got his eye, his ear, his soul full of the mercy of God. Merciful and gracious. God is gracious. God's gracious. We've affronted him. We've maligned him. We've cursed him. We've treated him like a dog. We've drug his name through the mud. Yet his gracious Holy Spirit comes back to us and woos us. Tells us how much he loves us. He wants us to get right. We treat each other like that while we puff up like a big toad frog and won't speak to each other. Pout up and stomp away. Amen. If we treated each other the way we treat God, we just couldn't handle it. But God is merciful. So how do you know He's merciful? Because He's come to me. He's come to me, and I didn't deserve it, and I knew I didn't deserve it, and God knew I knew I didn't deserve it. Yet He came to me, and He was merciful, and He was gracious, and He forgave, and He saved. A man that's never forgiven another man, is probably I have, a pro I have a lot of problem believing he's ever been forgiven. Once you've been forgiven, you forgive. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 20 talks about the promises of God. Let's read this one too because it's good. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20. 2 Corinthians 1, 20. Here's what it says. For all the promises of God in Him are yea and in Him amen unto the glory of God by us. There's something about the Lord Jesus Christ that gives glory to God the Father. It does. All the promises of God are in Christ. And they are yea, yes, and amen, let it be so. He cannot deny you. If you come into Christ Jesus, all the promises are made real to you. cannot deny you. And Christ is made into us righteousness, holiness, He's made unto us all these things, and the promises of God are in the Lord Jesus Christ. A preacher, I've tried, and I just can't seem to get Christ into my life. I got an email from a man yesterday. I get the, not an email, I get these things on the prayer page, on the internet prayer page. Folks, it's the most remarkable thing in the world you start reading these prayer requests these people send. I read them. I read every one of them. They send these prayer requests in. I get out on my knees in that closet and I start praying for them. There's no way I can remember all their names, but I call them out to God. One man writes and says, God deliver me. I'm back into homosexuality. And oh, I'm miserable. Oh, I'm miserable. He said, I'm dead in my soul. The only thing that can deliver you from homosexuality is the power of God. Amen. The blood of Christ. Amen. That's the only thing. I get, letter, I get one from a mother that says, my son is wicked. He's on drugs. He's hateful. He's spiteful. Would you pray for him? Another one said, my husband's chasing women. He's running here. He's running there. Please pray for him. All kinds of prayer requests. A lot of people send prayer requests and say, I'm hurting. I'm sick. My body's aching. I'm falling apart. Pray for me. All kinds of prayer requests. All kinds. And so we pray for them. I believe God gave me a ministry to pray. You know something, folks? 
Sometimes you go in that prayer closet and you have to fight. It's not bells and halos and wind blowing and, and angels singing when you go into your prayer closet every time. The other day I went in my prayer closet, I got on my face, shut the door, started praying, and I felt the power of God on my soul, and it was wonderful. But I've gone into that prayer closet time and time and time again. When I got down on my knees and I started crying out to God, it was a battle. A battle. But I go back, and I go back, and I go back, and I go back, and I go back. And then I walk by that closet and I look in there and I think, man, there's a life in there. There's something special about that room that is established and written in my soul. That's, that's, that's where I, I, I go in there. There's no other place in the house like that closet. I shut the door and I go in there and I battle. I get a hold of God. I pray. Sometimes I talk directly to Satan. Sometimes I say, you unclean spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, leave me. And I feel him leave. Sometimes I say to them, you have no hold on me. You don't belong. You have no claim on me. I belong to Christ. I've been born again. I've been washed in the blood. I begin to speak it out loud. I say it directly to these spirits. Find them, pull back away. Now, most religious people think, well, your pastor's crazy. They say that because they pray their rote prayers from their prayer books and their hearts never in it because it doesn't change their life. They go out here and live like hell itself. And then they have their little religious experience on Sunday. That's what they do. That's how they live. I know all about it. And that's why there's no power in the church. God will save, God will heal, and God will deliver. If you need to be delivered, come to the Lord Jesus. He'll deliver you. If you need healing, come to Him. He said, by His stripes you were healed. If you need to be saved, come to the Lord Jesus. There's no other name under heaven. Glory to God, whereby we must be saved. Amen. No other name but the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm a preacher of the Son of God, and that's why I live, and that's why I'm here, and that's what my life is about. The Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about a denomination. It's not about a movement. It's not about a fellowship. It's not about a preacher. It's not about anybody. It's about the Son of God. And I want to know Him. And I want to know Him more. I want to know Him more than I know Him now. And I know, he's, I know I'm born again. But I want to know more about Him. When He raised me up off that bed a year ago, I started getting on my knees like I'd never been on my knees before. And over a year later, every single day, down on my face, down on my face, down on my face, I feel things begin to move. I feel things begin to happen. I feel things begin to, I feel things, I feel things. And so I go back in that closet. I go back in that closet. I encourage you tonight before you leave out of here, make up your mind you're going back in that closet. Go back in there. I've tried. Well, that's, that's all right. Go back. Go back. Go back. He's alive, folks. There's real power in the name of Jesus. There's healing power, saving power, delivering power. The blood of Christ. You may not be able to see the demons, but Jesus Christ can, and His blood has ripped the power. He has ripped them. He has, he has destroyed their power by His power at the cross. The blood of Christ. They know Him. They know Him. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd use what I've said for the glory of God. I love you, Holy One, and I bless your name. I exalt thee and lift thee up. Lord, I'm nothing. Oh, I'm nothing. I'm, I'm a piece of clay. God, everything I have tonight that has any value, that means anything whatsoever, has come from thee. You've been good to me, Lord. You've been good to me, and I bless you for it. I bless you for it. I bless you for it. In Jesus' sweet holy name I pray. Brother Ed Williams, lead us in prayer tonight. Would you do that? Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, Yes. for this privilege that we've had to come to church tonight, Lord. 
Father, we could have been anywhere else we wanted to go tonight. We yeah. chose to come here, Lord. Yeah. It didn't just happen. There was something here tonight, Lord, and I thank you for that. I thank you for the spirit that's showed up here tonight. Thank you for this church and this pastor that's been so loyal there, God, over the years. Stand and preach your word and not back away from it, Lord, but stands and, 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 and preaches what you've written. Father, we ask you to bless them. Thank you for your word tonight. Bless the ones that couldn't be here tonight, dear God. Father, I want to thank you personally for answering prayers. I knew that you would, Lord, when I called up on you the first time. I knew in your time you would. I thank you for that. I thank you for these requests that's been made tonight, dear God, that you'll continue to bless and touch each one of them. And Father, we just want to tell you we love you because you first loved us. As Preacher Lawson has already said, you've been good to me. Yes. You have blessed me beyond anything I could ever imagine, Lord. Yes. And I owe you nothing. It's all been faithful. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Lord, for that precious blood that washes white as snow. Yes. I love you. Thank you for my family. Thank you for everyone here tonight, Lord. We pray that you'll give them travel mercy as they return home tonight. Yes, Lord Jesus. yes. Protect them. Yes, yes. And bring them back to Sunday, dear God. Thank you once again for your saving power, Lord, and for your precious, precious blood, your love, and for your Son, Jesus, my Lord and Savior. In his name I pray and for his sake I ask you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.